Okay, for our next talk, we'll stay in India, and uh, Dr. Jane Carlton will talk about the India isomer. Thank you. Uh, well, thanks very much uh, for the invitation, Peter. I think this is a fantastic uh, meeting. We should have one every year or every other year. <laughs> anyway, it would be nice to see us all coming together regularly for this. Um, I'm going to be talking about the Center for the Study of Complex Malaria in India. Um, so uh, this is the group of investigators here. Let's see if I can get the mouse. Mass is going to be here. That's right. Um, so this is a true partnership. Um, there's a level of sophistication in terms of the research which is underca undertaken in India, which means that our uh, collaborators are true partners in India. And we have collaborated with the National Institute of Malaria Research, so, uh, shown here. Uh, this is many of us here at New York University, um, at Penn State, and then also uh, at SAIL down here. And let me tell you a little bit about the National Institute for Malaria Research, uh, which is where our collaborators are based. Under the directorship of Dr. Nina Valetcher, shown here, this is the headquarters in Delhi, a purpose-built um, building uh, within sectories and lab facilities that was built about eight years ago. And NIMR is the only institute in um, India which does basic and applied research. It has, uh, it's very well connected to the National Vector-Borne Disease Control Program as well. And they run these uh, 10 or 12 uh, field sites, as you can see round about uh, in India uh, here. And we actually have partnered up with three of those field units that I'll be telling you a little bit about. Um, down here, this is SAIL. Um, so this is the... Um, a, a new component, actually. So this is Sanjeev Mahanti and uh, Dr. Satapathy as well. And this is at ISPAT uh, General Hospital. And this is one of the hospitals in India uh, in an uh, endemic region which has an MRI machine. And we have partnered up with them and with colleagues in Malawi. And I'll be telling you um, a lot about that work as well. Um, so I don't need to give you too much background about India and malaria because Pradeep uh, did a lot of that for me. Um, but basically, uh, this is a map from 2000. We know that malaria has decreased in incidence a lot since here, uh, since uh, 2000 in the past uh, 15, 16 years. This is the real hotbed here. So this is the um, central eastern states and then also up here the eastern states too. Um, Falciparum and Vivax are the predominant species. There's some P. malari that we get in one of our field sites. Six Anopheles species are thought to transmit uh, malaria. And this is really how the malaria situation has decreased um, over the past decade or so. Uh, these are um, figures taken from the National Vector-Borne Disease Control Program. You can see uh, probably widely inaccurate. That's about 400 deaths from falciparum, which we really know is, is an, uh, inaccurate. Uh, but the total number of cases really decreasing uh, over that period. And as I said, a number of uh, Anopheles species that transmit the parasite, very complicated species complexes, but these are located in what is thought to be different regions of India. So Stevens eye is the main urban vector. Culicifaces, which causes about 60% of the malaria, is found in rural and peri-urban areas too. So our center uh, is called, as I said, the Center for the Study of Complex Malaria in India. And, and why did we call it that? Well, it's because malaria infections in India are highly complex. An individual can be infected with more than one plasmodium species, vivax or falciparum, and occasionally malaria. 
And an individual can also be infected with more than one genetically different strain as well. And so why does this matter? Well, for a whole host of reasons. Uh, it, uh, infection dynamics influences clinical outcome. If you're infected with falciparum, are you going to go on to develop cerebral malaria, for example? If you're infected with Vivax, uh, will you have the hypnozoite uh, formed and a potential for relapses? Uh, mixed genotypes uh, enable generation of novel strains, of course, and competition between clones within a host selects for increased uh, resistance and virulence. So our overall theme is the analysis of single and mixed species and single and mixed genotype infections, which we call together complex malaria, generated by falciparum and vivax, and how this influences disease outcome, vector transmission, and drug resistance. And our three um, projects, which were NIAID mandated projects, we have an ongoing epidemiology project to determine the baseline epidemiology genetic diversity at three different sites, a transmission project um, run by colleagues at Penn State, really looking at the environmental conditions that determine malaria uh, transmission at two of our sites, and then a large genomics project, uh, developing a next generation sequencing core uh, to look at genetic diversity in vivax, and then also track the changes in frequency of clones within a patient before and after drug treatment. And just to show you our field units, I wanted to show you this quick movie. Um, this is India, and our field sites should be coming up here. So we're going to zoom in to Raukila, and I hope nobody gets motion sickness from this. Uh, this is our forested area. Anopheles culicifaces is the major vector. You can really see how forested it is. Um, uh, Plasmodium falciparum is the major species, Plasmodium vivax less so. And we work in a number of these uh, villages, as you can see here. Our field teams go out, uh, enroll patients, and collect samples. And uh, the main town is called Raukila. Um, as we come out, uh, we'll go up, uh, or down the coast, I should say, to Chennai. So this is our urban malaria um, site. This is our field station here that NIMR has. And now we're zooming in then to, in particular, the Besant Naga catchment area. So these are areas along the coast, this is the sea here, um, where there are slum houses, uh, fishermen's houses. And these houses in particular, these places, are hotspots for a lot of uh, plasmodium transmission. This is plasmodium vivax, by the way, and no. Okay, plasmodium vivax. Um, and Anopheles stevensi is the major vector. That was, Plasmodium, uh, that was Nadiad, where there's a mixture of vivax and falciparum, and uh, culicifaces is the majority vector there, and that was a peri-urban um, sort of deforested area. So those are our three field uh, units. Okay. So we spent uh, the first few years of the project renovating uh, and equipping our three field study sites. Um, maybe one of the things I should mention, Pradeep didn't uh, mention, but we have to have Government of India approval before we can work in India, and that took approximately a year. So in fact, uh, our field sites have not been going for, uh, they've only been going for about four, four and a half years now. And uh, a lot of the time we were um, taking known field stations, which NIMR had developed, uh, renovating them um, and uh, updating them with equipment. This is a visit that Mala uh, took to our particular unit when we had a, an opening by the uh, CEO of the Rakula steel plant. Uh, lots of fanfare. Um, we also undertook staffing and training and technology transfer as well in Raukila, Chennai, and Nadiad. Um, uh, these are some of the photographs here. This is us setting up um, molecular biology labs at each of the three sites. This is uh, some um, training going on for Anopheles uh, larvae identification. This is the sense of relief on the data entry operator when she found hanging folders, finally, for the filing cabinet to put the consent forms in. And at each of the three sites, then, um, we have undertaken these epidemiology projects. 
And uh, the schematic is shown here. So we start each of the projects with a census at the three sites, um, and then we undertake passive and active uh, epidemiology studies. So for the passive surveillance, it's a clinic study. These are people coming into clinics at the three different sites uh, where they're screened, screened and enrolled and then followed up uh, up to about day 42. I must say day 42 is probably not long enough for many of the studies involving Vivax. We didn't get very many relapses in that time. Uh, so going forward, I think we might change that. Um, then for the cross-sectional and longitudinal studies uh, shown here, so the cross-sectional was 400 subjects at random four times a year, and the long longitudinal was 100 subjects, 100 houses, I should say, uh, followed uh, four times a year. And we also undertook a reactive case detection um, project as well, which was just done at a couple of sites. I'm not going to go through all of these um, because there's too much. I'm going to pick a few key projects with interesting findings. And this is just to show as well that for each of the samples, for each uh, individual, the samples were collected, uh, which were blood spots, uh, slides, uh, microvet, and RDT. And these were then processed if positive, uh, vacutainer was collected, RNA, DNA, species-specific PCR. Oops. And then these would go on to be genotyped by microsatellites, single copy genes, amplicon sequencing, whole genome sequencing. Uh, the sera was used for uh, ELISAs and the Feldner protein arrays. I won't have time to talk about those. And then also for transmission studies too. So we've been doing a, a lot of those. Transmission uh, at NIMR, particularly in Chennai, is, is, um, is quite routine now. And then all of the uh, samples and all of the data uh, entered into our REDCap database. So some of the findings. Well, our first question was, what is the baseline epidemiology of malaria at our three field sites? And these were some of the people involved at the, uh, in Nadiad, Raukila, and Chennai, what are called the officers in charge uh, at NIMR, and then also NYU, our epidemiologist, Anna Maria Van Eyck. What we did find, uh, looking at all of the data so far, is that there's a high burden of asymptomatic and submicroscopic infections. This is actually the first time um, that PCR detection of plasmodium has happened in India at uh, multiple sites. There have only been a couple of studies previously on a much smaller number of samples. Um, we found malaria prevalence very low at all three sites. You can see uh, by PCR indicated here. Uh, Vivax dominating, as we had previously thought, a ratio of 70 to 30 in these two sites. Falciparum predominating in Raukila, uh, 80 to 20. Almost all of our Vivax infections have gametocytes, uh, very similar to what Joe was, was saying. Uh, risk factors for malaria were uh, being male in the season, significant anemia, um, and we really see a high burden of asymptomatic infections, up to 73% of our detected infections were asymptomatic. And our submicroscopic infections was also high, up to 70%. And that's shown in this graph here. So if you just take a look at the microscopic infections, so uh, falciparum being very dominant in Raukila, uh, Vivax in Chennai, um, then these are the submicroscopic uh, burden. You can see here, we're really missing a lot uh, due to those submicroscopic infections. And I think this really gives us an idea of going forward now that India has uh, announced its elimination plan uh, of what to focus on. Um, some other interesting findings from our census. We had a look at the common use of mosquito repellents. So in India in particular, and I think in China too, um, there's an extensive market for uh, mosquito repellents such as mats and coils. You've probably all seen these. That's a coil. Uh, this requires electricity. Um, uh, it's a vaporizer. Uh, they constitute about a 1.5 billion industry, um, which makes up about close to 3% of the per capita uh, income per year. Um, so um, it's really quite an industry. There are, th I think, three or four different main companies that produce uh, these particular repellents. And of course, they haven't been widely evaluated, unlike ITNs or IRS as well. And we found that at our three sites, the use of repellents was common, um, and Raukila nets are used a bit more. And we had a look at the percentage of malaria infections as well, and that's shown here. So uh, basically, to the right-hand side is no use of repellent or vaporizer or coil, 
and then to the left-hand side is use of repellent or vaporizer or coil. So you can see that um, repellent use is associated with significantly less malaria. Uh, this is among our clinic study participants, actually in our survey participants. We didn't always find this. We didn't always find an association. And so we've really ended this study saying further clinical testing and evaluation of safety would be very useful for some sort of evidence-based recommendation of the use of these repellents, especially seeing as there's such a big industry uh, in India. We also undertook a reactive case detection, um, and we found it wasn't a useful uh, strategy at our sites. We did this in Nadiad and Raukila, and uh, just to briefly go through this, um, basically a, an index case would go back home and the household members would be surveyed and, the, and then the neighbors as well within a particular uh, distance and proximal and distal to that. And we did this in Chennai. Here's Chennai and uh, the index cases indicated and then uh, the roundabout surveying that we did and then also in Nadia too. So out of approximately equal number of index cases um, in Chennai, we only found four cases that were positive by PCR and close to 900 contacts. Um, this is a very urban, dense, densely populated area. Um, no malaria in uh, 131 contacts. There were enormous logistical difficulties for us to do this, just getting from A to B, the people being unwilling to participate, especially if they were leaving for school or uh, weren't present during the day. Uh, temperatures um, often exceeding 40 degrees Celsius and very labor intensive as well. Uh, so we've really, I think, ended this particular study saying, and we're not entirely sure about the value of reactive case detection, especially in a Vivax endemic setting. Um, and especially in our intensely urban uh, area. Okay, moving on to a second area, and this is looking at the environmental conditions in India determining malaria transmission with a number of different uh, collaborators, including Matt Thomas here. And Matt in particular was very interested in trying to characterize the microclimate in urban settings. When you think about it, the temperatures that a mosquito um, uh, has in a thatched building as opposed to in a uh, concrete overhead tank must vary quite tremendously and that's got to vary uh, how the parasite um, develops in the mosquito. And sure enough it does, so uh, over about a year or so there was a pilot study putting loggers into these different uh, structures which are shown down here throughout Chennai and you can really see the temperature differences here. This is the NOAA, so this is a, a local um, station, national climatic data center station, and you can see how widely different actually the data loggers are to the reported NOAA. Um, another study we did was to try and identify where the immature, um, immature mosquitoes were, were breeding. Uh, this once again is also in Chennai, shown here. So uh, these are a lot of the cases from 2012 and from 2013 plotted. And we did a 12-month weekly study of the available clear and clean water and mosquito breeding habitats. And we found that overhead tanks really seem to contribute significantly to the immature Anopheles stevensi burden, uh, as shown uh, down here. And that's just been accepted for publication. And we also found a preference of the adult Stevens Eye for cattle sheds in Chennai too. So a big problem in Chennai is these illegal cattle sheds. Uh, they're indicated in blue, uh, bright blue, <coughs> shown here, kind of magenta color. Um, uh, and these are uh, cases from 2012 and 2013, shown here. Uh, the problem with these illegal cattle sheds is that they really seem to be um, a place where uh, uh, Anopheles stevensi adults like to stay. Um, uh, you can see down here, for example, the figures, uh, the numbers that we were able to collect uh, from the cattle sheds compared to dwellings which are very close. All of the cattle sheds were right next to human dwellings within five meters or so. Uh, we also found the first report from Chennai of uh, plasmodium parasites in Anopheles subpictus as well, which is something that Pradeep had uh, mentioned in his talk too. So just a few snippets then of our transmission studies. Uh, we've also been developing and using next generation um, genomics as well to study the genetics of malaria parasites. And this in particular was, is with Andrew Reed at Penn State. 
And we've developed a next generation sequencing uh, facility in Delhi. We decided to use the Iron Torrent PGM uh, platform. This is it shown here. It's basically a bench top uh, sequencer, next gen sequencer. You can take it out of the box. Um, it's basically like a big pH uh, machine and it uh, identifies hydrogen ions as the DNA strand extends. And this is the chip here. Uh, oops. Um, uh, these chips where you put your sample and run on the machine. And we actually thought it would be the easiest uh, system to have uh, because it doesn't require a lot of uh, computational power and bioinformatics. Um, however, we do provide an enormous amount of bioinformatics and wet lab support. These are two of the postdocs uh, in the lab who are basically on call all the time and provide constant support uh, for this particular uh, facility um, and also through training as well. We also find it very difficult to get kits and reagents in India, so we have to purchase and ship a lot of kits from the US to India too. And some of the things that we're starting to develop then on this particular platform, we've developed an Amplicon seq method for surveillance. So this is a way that we can multiplex 96 samples um, and looking at uh, six genes. So we can look at uh, 600 total in one particular run. And we've developed this for a whole range of different drug resistance markers for falciparum, but also for uh, COI markers, so markers which are very genetically polymorphic and we know will uh, tell us how many clones are in an individual too. Uh, so this is the schematic here. This is sort of the coverage. It's the whole length of the gene. It's not just a portion of it which is uh, wonderful for identifying new potential mutations as well, and also for identifying mixtures of resistant and sensitive clones within the same uh, patient. In fact, we have one particular patient here, and you can see the mixtures uh, of the alleles uh, shown here for three different uh, uh, genes. Um, these are some of the new mutations that we found in the K13 propeller, none of them associated with artemisinin resistance. Um, right now, we're running all of our samples through the, uh, this Amplicon Seq pipeline, basically so that we can track changes in the frequency of the parasite clones during the course of a drug treatment. So we've got uh, day zero and then follow-up for various patients, uh, and which also should hopefully give us an indicator of drug resistance emergence too. Um, one of the uh, interesting findings over the years by looking at a number of uh, single copy genes or a handful of genes is that Vivax seems to show greater genetic diversity than falciparum. And one of the, uh, this is one of the topics that we wanted to investigate. And in particular, um, we wanted to generate the first Vivax and falciparum uh, whole genomes from India. Um, there were no whole genomes available uh, when we started this work. Um, and as Pradeep mentioned, that means that many of the papers up until now uh, were unable to show what India genetic diversity looked like. So we rectified this. Um, here you can see uh, a number of Vivax uh, strains from Brazil, India, Mauritania, North Korea. And we chose five falciparum lines which matched from the same regions. We ran them through next generation sequencer, the Illumina, um, and um, had a look at the genetic diversity, and that's shown here. You can see uh, in this particular figure, you've got the genotype quality along the left here, that these are all the uh, falciparum isolates, these are all the Vivax isolates. Vivax really seems to show twice as much in this particular figure uh, genetic diversity compared to falciparum. And it doesn't matter whether you look at a different type of um, genetic um, markers such as, uh, or type of genetic variations such as microsatellites uh, shown here, or where you look in the genome too. And these, uh, this functional, um, this genetic diversity has functional consequences as well. We found a lot more non-synonymous SNPs in red blood cell invasion and immune response genes as well. I'm not showing the data here. And this uh, made us pronounce that actually vaccines targeting polymorphic antigens in Vivax may even be more compromised due to potential strain-specific immunity, which we already uh, know occurs in falciparum. And so our last sentence of this particular paper, which was published in Nature Genetics in 2012, is that it reinforces the belief that Vivax malaria will be the more difficult parasite to eliminate. And I still very much, very much believe that. Um, now I have a bit of a weird thing to do. 
Um, this next set of data is under embargo at Nature Genetics, so I need to ask no live streaming, please. This is at the request of Nature Genetics, not me. <laughs> so I apologize, otherwise I would show you. And it's a collaboration then with Sanjeev Mahanti, uh, Dr. Satapathy, Terry Taylor, and then also Arian Dondorf, who actually was one of the key people uh, who, who first started working with Sanjeev Mahanti um, and Saroj Mishra uh, about a decade ago. And so we're taking advantage of two MRI platforms in endemic settings uh, to look at cerebral malaria. Obviously, cerebral malaria, the pathophysiology, is really uh, not known at all. So this is ISPAT General Hospital. It's close to 700-bed tertiary care hospital, 1.5 Tesla. Um, for example, in 2015, uh, we had 130 severe mala malaria patients, 53 with cerebral malaria, 11 pediatric as well. So we see a lot of adult cerebral malaria cases. This is um, a Queen Elizabeth Central Hospital in Blantyre, Terry Taylor's uh, Institute, um, and they have a 0.35 Tesla. Since 2009, they've seen about 450 cerebral malaria cases, um, uh, all of them actually uh, children. So this was a special project then, very much um, facilitated by MALA as well, uh, between these two particular isomers, uh, uh, the Malawi, Malawi isomer, India isomer, running out of time. Um, these are the MRI machines here. Our really interesting findings shown here is that brain lesions are identified in 50% of children and adults. Uh, so these are the number of cases that we've collected. These are the number of children here. Um, and, in fact, we have a very interesting finding that the swelling um, uh, that's found is very um, redolent of a particular syndrome called posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome. So you can see here this is a five-year-old patient uh, where there is a thickening of this entire cortical mantle and then 48 hours later is completely resolved. And this is a particular syndrome which has been identified a few years ago. This is the first time there's been a link then between severe falciparum infection and PRES, uh, the syndrome in non-fatal CM um, malaria. And that's just been submitted for publication. Okay, just wrapping up. This is a kind of fun slide um, a few years ago at our SAG meeting, we had to put together the numbers, uh, I think, so we could be quantitative about our success. And so this is a slide kind of left over from that. Number of household census, close to 5,000. Individuals enrolled, 10,000. Samples collected, PCRs, uh, protein assays. I haven't talked about that. And then publications, front covers, a bit more fun. Number of retirements, four. Number of weddings, 10. There are a lot of weddings in India. Number of divorces, one. At least that's all I know of. Number of CSMI children, seven. Lots of babies, none in the USA. And we had a US Senate staff delegation as well. Uh, so this is the majority Senator Tom Harkin and a minority uh, Senator too. And they're directly in charge of the 170 billion DHS, uh, DHHS budget. And so we took them around our Chennai field site um, a few years ago. So, um, okay. And one last thing, actually, sort of joking aside, there are two key people in our isomer that I really want to thank, and because both of them passed away. Uh, Hema Joshi was instrumental in a lot of the genetics and genomics work that, on, uh, that I'm involved in in India. She was my main collaborator. And then Soro, uh, Saroj Mishra, who passed away um, earlier this year, uh, who was at ISPAT General Hospital, who really started a lot of the uh, MRI studies as well. Um, and I'll leave it there. We have time for one or two questions. Very nice talk, Jane. Uh, my question is, uh, like in India, if, uh, I'm sure you know the history in 1970s, it's the malaria is kind of almost eradicated. At least the government was, uh, I don't know whether they announced it or not, the malaria was almost eradicated. So the Indian Malaria Research Institute, uh, I think they do have a lot of uh, parasites collected uh, before 70 or mid 70s, I'm, I'm not sure. 
do you look at the genotypic difference between the, the early 70s uh, falsely parasite genotype or the YVAX genotype and the one you collected uh, now, the recently, the current one? We haven't, actually, but that's a really interesting point. Maybe we should look into that. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you.